This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Hello, and welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. It's the week before Halloween. I hope you're all doing something super fun to prepare. I think I'm going to make my mom's recipe for a giant chocolate cinnamon roll this weekend, since the weather will be more conducive to me having my oven on, and a lot more spooky. I don't think I have any news, other than you can send your submissions to scarytosleep at gmail.com. I'm looking forward to some more winter themed stories maybe even some holiday themed ones i don't know that's up to you guys and your beautiful brains all right let's go ahead and get started shall we this first story is full of halloween fright this is by elias withrow and it's called the coffin in the hills I moved to a new house a few weeks ago. It was a simple two-story house in the hills of West Virginia down a fairly residential road nestled between a cluster of looming trees. It had been on the market for a long time apparently, so I purchased it at an almost criminal price. I couldn't figure out why. The foundation solid, the interior is in amazing condition. It was just at the end of the street. My neighboring residents scattered before me like an audience in a throne room. It was just outside of a small town, a quaint, fairly poor stretch of the state. I was pleased with the move. I was away from the noise of D.C. and, more importantly, away from the bad memories I left behind. A broken marriage, the loss of a beautiful apartment, and an inevitable divorce. Thank God I didn't have any kids. My new home offered seclusion and privacy while also hosting a receptive community. Within the first couple days, I had met all my neighbors, each of them quite a different flavor of humanity than I was used to. Their casual ways and welcoming attitudes were gratefully accepted by myself, a stark contrast to the cold, business-like nature of the big city. I unpacked fairly quickly. I had left most of my belongings in the city with my ex. I wanted a fresh start ridding myself of unwanted ties to the life I was living. Once I was settled, and with Halloween approaching, I decided to decorate my house with the usual seasonal decor. I wanted to show my new neighbors that I could be just as welcoming as they had been to me. I didn't want to be the creepy single guy at the end of the street. After a quick trip to the local supermarket, I was soon placing pumpkins on my front steps, stringing cotton cobwebs along the shrubbery, and even going so far as to purchase a plastic mummy along the front steps. Along with the decorations, I made sure to get more than enough candy for the expected trick-or-treaters, my shopping cart filling quickly with candy corn, full-size candy bars, and assorted mixes. Being my first Halloween in a new neighborhood, I wanted to give out the best stuff. As Halloween drew closer, I noticed the surrounding houses weren't putting on a show like I was. No pumpkins, no golden wreaths, no plastic ghosts, nothing. I shrugged it off, now hoping I wasn't coming off as tacky. The day before Halloween, I asked one of my neighbors down the street what I should expect in terms of trick-or-treaters. He gave me a hesitant look and informed me that no one really came down this street hunting for candy. I felt my heart sink. I'd been looking forward to seeing the local costumes and pieced together outfits that riddled every October 31st. None? I asked, trying not to let my disappointment show. He shook his head and told me that maybe there'd be one or two at most, and he said something strange that made me pause. He said that if they knew what was good for them, they wouldn't risk it. I asked him what he meant, and... He seemed eager to separate himself from the subject. I pressed further, and finally, 
He looked into my eyes and told me, on Halloween I should shut my lights off and lock my doors. He told me to stay away from the windows. Confused, I asked him what he was talking about. He leaned in close, pointing towards the distant hills and whispered, If you know what's good for you, you'll go to bed early and wait for sunrise. Nothing good comes out of those hills on Halloween. And with that, he turned away and went into his house. I snorted, dumbfounded. What the hell was he talking about? What was in the hills? I easily brushed the conversation away, dismissing it as some ridiculous fiction. I eagerly placed the oversized bowl of candy by the front door and turned on the outside lights. I opened the front door and breathed in the crisp evening air, filling my head with country scents. The sun had disappeared behind the hills, bleeding an expanse of deep purple across the horizon. A full moon was eagerly climbing the sky to meet an array of twinkling stars. I grinned. What a perfect Halloween. I closed the door and ran upstairs to my bedroom to retrieve a plastic clown mask I'd purchased earlier that day. I thought it would be fun for the kids who came to my door. I snatched it up off my bed and thundered back downstairs, excited anticipation growing inside of me. My neighbor's warning the previous day was the furthest thing from my mind. If he didn't want to give out candy, that was fine, but I refused to open the door empty-handed in case someone did come. I went to my living room and plopped myself down in a chair by the window. From there, I had a perfect view of my front lawn and driveway. The handful of trees occupying the quarter acre before me towered in the night air, their empty branches reaching for the brilliant moon like twisting claws. I reached for a book and turned on the lamp, the growing darkness outside now creeping into my house. I read for a while, occasionally looking outside in hopes of spotting some trick-or-treaters. I noticed that every other house on the street was pitch black. No lights, no movement, nothing. All the windows had curtains drawn across them, shielding them from the street. What a bunch of downers, I mused. In direct contrast, my house was lit up like a beacon, a shining torch at the end of a dark runway. I went back to my book, pushing my neighbor's lack of holiday cheer aside. I became lost in the pages and time reached out and pushed the hands of the clock forward at an alarming pace. Eventually, I looked up and saw that it was almost ten. Sighing, I placed my book down and took one last look outside. Nothing. Well, you tried, I said to myself. I stood and began to turn off the lights, doing my best not to feel let down. I went into my kitchen, and as I was about to flick the light switch, I paused. I thought I heard something outside, coming from the woods the kitchen window looked out into. I went to the window and peered out into the dense woods, listening. There. It was distant, but unmistakable. What the hell? I whispered to myself. It sounded like... whales. I cracked the window and turned my head, waiting for a repeat of the sound. After a few moments, it came again. A low, wailing cry. Then two, then three, all mixing together to form a creeping howl that echoed across the woods. What on earth, I thought, a shiver running through me. What is that? The cry repeated, the distant notes hovering and filling the night. I closed the window and locked it. It had to be some wildlife, maybe a deer or wild dog or something. I reminded myself that I was new to the country and unaccustomed to the way things sounded or acted out here. I turned away and finished shutting off the lights. I locked the front door and was about to go upstairs when something made me stop. It was this feeling, this cold finger in my chest pointing me to the front window. Fear tickled my stomach, but I pushed it aside telling myself to calm down. What the hell was I getting worked up about? Because some weird noise was in the woods? I was going to have to get used to that. And yet, 
That icy finger still stirred in my chest, urging me to look out the window. I licked my lips and then snorted. (laughs) I was being ridiculous. I marched to the window and looked out. See, I said to myself, staring out into my empty front lawn and driveway. There's (laughs) not... The word caught in my throat. An unease rolled across my mind like a nauseous wave. I cupped my hands to the glass and stared out into the night. Was there something standing? My heart skipped a beat as I realized something was out there. I squinted in the darkness and bizarre recognition bloomed in my head. There was a coffin out there. It stood upright, facing me in the night. It was pitch black and reminded me of something out of a cartoon, something a vampire would emerge from, fangs shining. I put a hand over my chest, slowing my heart, my neighbor's warning resurfacing in my mind. I let out a chuckle and leaned my forehead against the glass. I see what's going on here. I said, a smile twisting my lips. Try and scare the new guy. I get it. Good one, everyone. Shaking my head, I turned away from the window, but a sudden rigor rocked my body. The noise I had heard earlier boomed outside my house, a rising cry that again reminded me of crying wails. Heart in my throat, I slowly turned around. The noise had come from my driveway this time. Pretty elaborate joke, I said to myself, voice not quite steady. As the call faded, I went to my front door and peeked out the side window. The coffin stood like a tombstone at the end of my driveway. The closed casket still and silent. As much as I didn't want to admit it, I was shaken. What if there was something to that warning? Don't be absurd, I said out loud, but immediately wished I hadn't. My voice in the impossible silence sounded like a cannon blast. I turned away from the window and climbed the stairs to the second floor. I went into the bathroom and brushed my teeth. All my neighbors are probably out there having a good laugh, I thought. Let's scare the city boy. It'll be a hoot. I rinsed my mouth out and washed my face, discarding the weirdness. I just wanted to go to bed. I wasn't going to play into their childish games. I turned the light off and entered the hallway, but stopped. Heart slamming into my chest. I could hear that strange noise again. But it sounded like it was coming from downstairs. It sounded like it was coming from my kitchen. What the hell? I whispered in the stillness as the noise died in silence. I crept to the balcony and peeked down. My eyes went wide and a coil of fear snaked around my throat. My front door was wide open. Okay, enough is enough, I croaked. Cautiously, I went to the stairs. My eyes trained on the open door. I swallowed hard, feeling unease and terror rising in my mind like a cold mountain. I suddenly stumbled and fell backwards up the stairs, shock rocketing through me like hot venom. The coffin was standing upright in the foyer, facing the kitchen. I scrambled to my feet and raked my mind. What the hell was going on? A gentle breeze drifted through the open door and curled up the stairs to lick my ankles. I placed my hand on the balcony, now staring directly down at the coffin. It remained motionless. A dark smudge in the dim black. I cleared my throat. 
<clears throat> okay, everyone. Very funny. I said, trying to control the fear in my voice. You got me. Come on out now. I blinked. And in that instant, the coffin vanished. I leaned down over the railing, scrubbing my eyes. There was no way. What is happening? My frantic mind screamed. What is going on? And that's when I noticed a black outline to my left at the far end of the hall by my bedroom. I spun, my eyes going wide, my breath leaving me in a rush of stale terror. The coffin stood, now facing me, mere feet away. I crashed into my bathroom and slammed the door, leaning against it, heart thundering against my ribcage like a chaotic drum. Sweat had formed on the back of my neck and my hands shook as I scrambled to lock the door. What is that thing? What is it doing in my house? I thought, jiggling the door handle to make sure it was secure. I waited for some sound. Some kind of movement, but none came. I counted off the minutes in my head, each second lasting an eternity. What the hell was I supposed to do here? The unnerving nature of the whole thing left my mind in shambles, the eerie invasion warping my sense of order. Suddenly, a soft coo slithered between the cracks in the door, a gentle call like a chorus of whispering wails. I jumped and backed away from the door, licking my dry lips. I could feel something on the other side of the wood, begging me to confront it. Get out of my house, I cried with little conviction. Leave me alone. The strange call continued. A soft, almost taunting string of melodic misery and hunger. And then the door shook as something heavy thundered into it, splintering the wood. I screamed, falling to the floor as my limbs gave way to fear. An unknown prayer flew from my lips as another thud cascaded into the small space, rocking the hinges. Sweat trickled into my eyes, and I looked around desperately for something to defend myself with. I grabbed a pair of scissors off the sink and clutched them to my chest, terror unearthing my imagination to form scenes of violence if the door gave way. Trick or treat! Hello? Anyone home? My eyes went wide in the darkness. The young voice slicing through the air like a razor from downstairs. The barrage against the door immediately stopped and a false silence returned. I don't think anyone's home. A second voice stated. Her voice muffled. It sounded like two young girls. Look at this candy though. Yeah, jackpot. I stood, still grasping the scissors, every ounce of me yearning to call out, to warn the unfortunate late-night trick-or-treaters about the invader. But cowardice kept my mouth shut as I went to the door and put my ear to the wood. I could hear the two girls scooping candy out of the big glass bowl I had left by the door. Run! 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 My mind screamed, placing a hand on the locked door. Suddenly, the entire house filled with the low, sad call, the melody rising to an ear-splitting level. I slammed my hands over my ears, wincing heart leaping into my throat. 
Downstairs, I heard the girls scream. And then something crashed to the floor in a spray of glass. One of the girls was screaming for her friend. Another crash rocked the house. The vibration running through the floor, up my trembling legs. The same girl was now screaming for help. Her voice cracking with hysteria, like she was seeing something that defied every sense of understanding. You have to do something! My mind screamed, those are children down there! Taking a deep breath, I unlocked the door and threw it up. I stumbled as another thud shook the house from down below and I tripped, sprawling to the floor. The screaming had stopped. The haunting cries had ceased. I reached out and retrieved the scissors I had dropped. My palms sweaty. Staying on my stomach, I crawled to the balcony and looked out between the spokes. A pool of blood crept across the floor, spreading like a rising bog across the wood. A thick swath of blood trailed across the floor and out the open door into the night. The girls were gone, and the house sat in silence. No, 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 I cried internally, vomit tickling the back of my throat. I wiped sweat from my eyes, surveying the scene with horrified clarity. Bloody handprints stained the walls, trailing dark blood upwards, like the girls had been lifted towards the ceiling. The coffin was nowhere to be seen. What have I done? I cried, tears forming in my eyes. Jesus, what have I done? Guilt swarmed me along with a sickening sense of dread. In the distance, Far into the night, I thought I heard the familiar, low cry echo across the hills. It sounded like a mockery. The local police arrived shortly after. My frantic phone call didn't do much to inform them what they were walking into. But the looks on their faces told me they already knew. Unspoken conversation passed between them as I explained the horrific events of the night. I thought they were going to lock me away. Tell me I was crazy. But they didn't. They were silent through the whole thing. Grim looks tightening their faces. When I mentioned the coffin, I saw their eyes meet. As more officers and detectives arrived, one of the police pulled me outside, away from the others. In a morbid voice, he whispered something to me. He told me to get away from this place. When I pressed him, he looked towards the hills and then hissed something in a desperate voice. He told me, that even hell has a front door. Hey there, it's the new year. You've got mood boards and resolutions and work is back in full swing and you don't need any extra stress in your life. And Factors Ready to Eat Meal Delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door with over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more. Plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Forget frantic 
lunch preps and rush dinners. Factor's two-minute meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals, all delivered right to your door. Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep me going no matter what's on the schedule. Skip the overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They are ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Need a special occasion meal? Gourmet Plus is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easily. When things get hectic, Factor is flexible. Change up your order every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Stress less over mealtimes in the new year. Factor's no prep, no mess meals free up time otherwise spent on shopping, cooking, and cleanup. No more wasting time in the kitchen. Not only does Factor offer fast, simple solutions when I'm too busy to cook, they also help me stay on top of my goals. With offerings like Protein Plus and Keto, I can stay on track. This is definitely going to come in handy for my New Year's goals. Factor has everything I need for a week of flavorful, nutritious eats. In addition to ready-to-eat meals, they have cold-pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep me energized during frantic times. Head to factormeals.com slash scareyoutosleep50 and use code scareyoutosleep50 to get 50% off. That's code SCAREYOU2SLEEP50 at FactorMeals.com. This next story is perfect for the Halloween season. We all know how every year the news or Facebook generates a story about drugs or razor blades or poison in your kid's candy. Well, what if it was something more otherworldly? This is by Thaddeus James, and he really needs you to know that within the next few months, a snack food called Moody Bites is going to be released in stores nationwide. Stay away from it. I'm not sure exactly when, but within the next few months, there will be a mass release of a sugary junk food product called Mooney Bites. You'll probably start seeing ads sometime in late November, early December, but it's possible that they may be released quietly at an earlier date. After all, Halloween is right around the corner, and what better holiday is there to serve candy I am employed by the marketing firm that was hired to help advertise this product. We're not a large firm by any means, and the company that hired us did so because they want to keep this on the down low. The company that is producing Mooney Bites is not well known at all, but they are incredibly well funded, and the execs I've talked with are all very confident in what they are doing. Just so you guys know what to look out for. I have sent in a photo of the Mooney Bites logo designed by my firm. You will also find a photo of what to expect in the bags, which will probably come in black. Look for these on this show's Instagram page. The snack is a fudge chocolate with white chocolate coating. It's made to resemble lunar rocks. I cut one in half in the photo so you can see the way it's layered. Everything about this product is fucking evil. The company producing it, Mooney Food, doesn't have a single friendly person in its staff. They seem to hardly want to speak about anything other than Mooney Bites. If merely the name comes up, they get super excited and will talk your ear off about how great it's going to be. Any other topic of conversation they couldn't possibly give a shit about. Sometimes they won't even respond to anything but their stupid junk food. They are complete assholes with disregard for anyone who isn't them. So, at the risk of my own job and possibly safety, I am coming forward to blow up their spot. Mooney Bites are not just bad for you in the conventional sense. They are potentially lethal. And I don't think they're made with ingredients from this planet. Why do I think this? Well, (laughs) let me tell you about Josh Morris. Some of you already know of him. 
but to those who don't, Josh was the creator and star of the YouTube channel Josh Morris Eats, which no longer exists thanks to Mooney Food and their fucking Mooney Bites. The channel was basically made up of humorous videos featuring Josh eating different snacks and reviewing them. Mostly new or weirder products for entertainment value. It wasn't a particularly popular channel, but it did have a few dozen thousand subscribers. Mooney Food thought that exposing their oh-so-perfect product to the internet would be a fantastic idea and asked our firm to get in contact with Morris for them. They would send him a sample and he'd try it and review it positively on his channel in exchange for compensation. Morris was pretty thrilled when we contacted him and immediately accepted the offer, so Mooney Food sent him the sample for review. The review went up a few days later, with Josh eating the entire bag of the snacks and praising it up and down. The video got quite a few thousand views, general interest in the comment section, everyone was happy. The next day, we got a call from Josh. He was freaking out, asking what was wrong with the Mooney Bites, telling us they were making him super sick. So my supervisor gave him the contact info for Mooney Food. Josh swore to us that he was going to make a new video bad-mouthing the ever-loving shit out of the snack. We kept checking the guy's YouTube page while trying to contact the Mooney Food execs about what had transpired. No video went up, and the company didn't speak to us for the next few days. One of my co-workers noticed that the Josh Morris Eats channel was not just closed, but completely non-existent. Like it had never been created. We never spoke with Josh again. A couple weeks went by, and our association with Mooney Food dwindled quite a bit. They were mad at us for our failed viral marketing attempt. But whenever they visited our firm... They would never answer our questions about what exactly about it had failed. My supervisor was getting pretty pissed at their attitude and eventually sent them an email saying that our firm was going to have to pass on any future business relations with their company. Mooney Food did not reply to the email. What they did instead was send our entire staff a complimentary bag of Mooney Bites. The other day, my co-worker Bill came up to me looking scared shitless, sweating, telling me that one of the Mooney Pod guys left a briefcase at his desk after coming in to transfer some files. The Mooney food reps were always so weird and off-putting that I didn't blame Bill for doing what he did. The suitcase had a flash drive in it, which Bill plugged into his computer to look through. Bill was so rattled by what he saw, he couldn't even tell me what it was. Just come look and see, he said. So I went to his computer and I I see that the flash drive folder is open on his desktop. Bill had opened a subfolder on it that its owner had thought was appropriate to call funny exclamation mark. It was four or five photos, probably taken on a cell phone, of Josh Morris dead. He was lying on what looked like some sort of medical table. There was a substance I did not recognize leaking out of his eyes, nose, and mouth. His face was a grayish blue color. It looked like he had just been suffocated to death by whatever was coming out of his face. It was absolutely horrible. I could barely look at it. But Bill told me there was more. Not photos this time. Saved emails. I can't recall them all exactly, but there was some bizarre shit that this company staff was sending to throughout its organization. I can think of some specific examples. Firstly, all sorts of shit about how what they're doing is quote-unquote absolutely legal and any sign of phase two, whatever the fuck that means, happening won't be brought into the public eye anytime soon. One email, it looked like a newsletter, kept referring to the Mooney Bites release date as the start. Another email containing the photos of Josh was sent to a handful of people, again titled, 
funny! Exclamation mark. One of the last ones I remember looked like a list of articles and essays about natural satellites. We told our supervisor about all of this and he immediately left to bring the suitcase to the police. The authorities took everything and instructed us not to contact Mooney Food again. I'll admit, I'm an investigative person at heart. Something as juicy as this was too good to pass up looking into. I stole something from the case before it was taken away by my supervisor and given to the police. It's a small Ziploc bag containing about an ounce of white, watery substance. I immediately recognized it as the liquid that was coming out of Josh's face in those horrible photos. Someone must have taken a sample to hang on to. I've also submitted a picture of the white watery substance. It smells just as gross as it looks. I have it sitting on a shelf a good five feet away from me right now, and I can smell it as if my face was in the bag with it. It reeks like burnt rubber. Once in a while, the liquid splashes by itself like as if someone was shaking the bag. I've been trying and failing to capture it on film. It only does it when I'm looking away or doing something else. It's like the shit's fucking with me. The bile also makes a noise when it's recorded. Not in the sense that it starts going off when I start filming it, though. The, the playback has a sound that the liquid seems to be emitting. Listen for yourself. I have not tried my complimentary bag of Mooney Bites. I refused to eat them, and I insisted my co-workers do the same. When that Josh kid ate his sample, this disgusting fluid built up inside him and asphyxiated him as a result. I'm going to take it one step further and say that I personally believe that creating this bile is what the product was made for in the first place. Like I said, everything about this is fucking evil, including the sick fucks behind it. If anyone from Mooney Food is listening to this, feel free to go fuck yourself. Consider all of this a PSA if you'd like. On Halloween, keep an eye on what your kids are eating to make sure none of this horrific shit happens to them. And for the love of God, when Mooney Bites gets released, don't buy them. That's exactly what these creeps want. And even I don't want to find out why. Update. The bile is gone. It's fucking gone. The bag is right where I left it, but it's completely empty save for a few stains. It could be anywhere now. Don't buy this junk food, guys. I'm serious. It's not from here. For this week's Halloween true crime story, I'm going to tell you the tragic tale of Lisa Ann French and the infuriating way the justice system works sometimes. I'm going to give a big trigger warning for this. Um, it's got child sexual assault and murder. Feel free to turn off the episode now or skip forward to the outro. I'll give you a second. I know I listen to podcasts while doing the dishes a lot and it takes me a minute to get the gloves off. So for my wet glove clad friends, this few seconds of rambling is for you. Okay, here we go. October 31st, 1973. Nine-year-old Lisa Ann French was about to set out to trick-or-treat in her neighborhood. She had wanted to be a butterfly, but Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, was having a cold October, so her mother insisted she dress as a hobo so she could bundle up. Lisa Ann agreed to this change in costume and said goodbye to her mother, clutching a bag that she anticipated filling with candy. She only made it to three houses that night. 
the last one being that of Gerald Turner. Gerald was a sort of friend of the French family. For a while, he was even their neighbor in a duplex. Lisa knew him. She spent sunnier days pushing Gerald's own baby in a stroller down the sidewalk. Gerald eventually moved a half a block away with his girlfriend, but the family, while not very close, was still friendly with the couple. Lisa wasn't supposed to be alone that night. She had made plans with her friend Anne to meet up and go to Pumpkin Place, where a family-friendly Halloween party was going on. Anne had gotten in trouble right before the big day, however, and was grounded from trick-or-treating. So, clad in a felt hat and an oversized green parka, Lisa went on her own. She made a quick stop at the party, but soon went in search of what all kids do on Halloween. Candy. Gerald was supposed to be going with his girlfriend, Arlene Penn, to visit her mother. Arlene says when she got home from the same party at Pumpkin Place that Lisa had attended around 715 Gerald was in his bathrobe. He told her he was sick and he would be staying home. So Arlene went to her mother solo. When Lisa got to Gerald's door, he asked her to come in. She probably didn't have one bad thought about it. After all, she knew Gerald. Gerald then led her upstairs to his bedroom. The internet has more specific details about what happened next than I honestly ever cared to have known. I will just give a blanket statement. Um, He raped her. If you want to know more details than that, then feel free to Google it on your own, but I'm just going to leave it at that. I've read two different reasons for her death. Some sources I found say she was strangled, but in Gerald's confession later on, he said he believed she died of shock. The examiner said it was a combination of shock and asphyxiation. Soon after this, Arlene actually returned home, saying she had forgotten that her mother wouldn't be home for another hour. Arlene said that in that hour she was home, Gerald kept excusing himself to go lay down in the bedroom, sticking with the story that he was feeling sick. Arlene states that she never went into the bedroom, where she would have found Lisa's dead body. After Arlene finally did leave for her mother's house, Gerald stuffed Lisa's nude body into two black garbage bags. He drove to a country road that ran along a field and dumped the trash bags and Lisa's clothing. By that night, the search for Lisa had started in full force. The PTA had something called block members, and they began calling the parents all around the neighborhood, urging parents to keep their outside lights on and to put signs in their windows. The search continued all night, and by the next day, over 1,500 people were searching. This is another thing where I found 1,500 people, and I also found 5,000 people. So somewhere between 1,500 and 5,000 people were searching, including the National Guard with their helicopters, and even locals with private planes volunteered to search from the skies. People with horses went out to local fields. The police dragged rivers and lakes. Volunteers with off-road vehicles went to the marshes to look. 6,000 copies of Lisa's photo were printed. Local gas stations, never known for their charity, were offering up to 25 gallons of free gasoline to those helping in the search. All of that in just two and a half days. Which is when farmer Gerald Braun was on his tractor on a country road at 11.30 on what was probably a very nice Saturday morning until he spotted two garbage bags curious, he opened up one bag and immediately got back on his tractor to get to the closest phone to call the police. The search for Lisa Ann Frank was over. The first officer on the scene, Wayne Geis, was quoted saying, it was the worst possible thing that could have happened. I saw that little girl, and I don't know how any man could do that. Turner should never ever be released. Halloween would not be the same for years to come in Fond du Lac. Now, all of this is rage-inducing, obviously, but if you aren't upset already, just you wait. Gerald Turner was interviewed by the police. He was asked about his whereabouts on Halloween. I couldn't find a reason why he was actually even considered a suspect, I assume maybe they were just interviewing everyone in the neighborhood because they came to his home. 
Police Captain Melvin Heller said something felt off about Turner. Heller asked if he would be willing to take a lie detector test. Turner agreed, and the test examiner said his results were not satisfactory. I read again later, um, after I actually wrote all of this, I was still researching because this was weird and I had to tell my husband all about it. And it turns out one reason that, or actually Turner didn't agree right away to the the exam. Um, He kept saying no because he had already been in trouble er like a few years earlier. I don't know the exact thing. Like I said, I I hadn't written this down when I initially wrote this. Um, He was accused of raping a babysitter. Um, who was also underage. I assume she was a teenager because it was called statutory rape. Um, And he said he had a really bad experience with the lie detector person. He kept having to show up and the the examiner was never there. It was just a really bizarre reason to like say no to an exam. And I mean, I know, and most of you who are true crime fans know that lie detector tests aren't 100% accurate. They're just not. They've turned, you know, when you take them, it goes off of, you know, your pulse and all this other stuff. And if you're nervous or even there are ways, there are literally books you can buy on how to beat lie detector tests. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that little tidbit in that he had been accused before of rape. I don't know what happened in that case because I only found that little tidbit about that's why he was so adamant about not taking a lie detector test. Let's go on. On August 8th, 1974, Turner finally confessed. But he later told the jury, just kidding, I didn't do it. When asked why he had initially confessed, he said, I got sick and tired of being harassed by police calling on me. But, I mean, in his confession, he even drew a diagram where he had disposed of Lisa's body and clothing. Um, And I believe, I don't, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it was one of those things, you know, where police will withhold information. That way they know, they can tell if it's the real killer because they'll know the specific information that was never released to the public. And I think that was one of those things. I read the trial notes and it was a very frustrating trial. And Gerald Turner tried to make it as difficult as possible. Eventually, he was found guilty of second-degree murder, enticing a child for immoral purposes, and acts of sexual perversion. He was dubbed the Halloween Killer. And here's where we get mad again, folks. He was only sentenced to 38 years in prison. Yep. And to make matters worse, he was paroled for good behavior in 1992 after raping and murdering a child... He only served 17 years and 8 months because he was a model prisoner. What the fuck? Let me throw out some quotes about this model prisoner. This is from Robert Owens, who testified. He's the chief psychologist at... Oh, I'm so sorry if I mispronounce this. This is so bad of me, but it's the Teichita Correctional Institution, which is a nearby women's prison. Prison. He actually testified. He said this. He has a cold disregard for people, mainly females. He does not have conscience control to inhibit his impulses for pleasure and to conform to society's laws. This next quote is from presiding circuit court judge Milton Meister during sentencing. He impressed me as showing no remorse, no feeling of repentance. That's your model prisoner. His release sprouted immense anger in the community. Protests broke out, demanding he be put back in prison for being a danger to society. He did go back in 1993 after angry citizens filed a lawsuit that led to an appeals court decision that the state erred in the way it calculated his mandatory release date. Gerald was up again for release in 1994, and it was blocked thanks to a new law named just for him, Turner's Law. The official name is actually the Sexual Predator Law, which allows Wisconsin to keep some people convicted of sex crimes in custody for treatment if they are deemed potentially violent. However, more howevers, in 1998... A jury of idiots decided that he did not fit that description of a violent sexual predator anymore. Even 
Ex-girlfriends and wives came out of the woodwork to testify that he was abusive. But they let him free. Turner's lawyer had the audacity to say, I don't think he'll do so much as jaywalk on parole. Guess again, buddy. He almost went back for waving a knife at people at his halfway house. I don't really know why that didn't get him immediately sent back. But what finally did was in 2003, he violated the terms of his parole. He, his parole officer, found hardcore pornographic images and videos on a computer and hardcore pornographic magazines at the Foster Community Correctional House where he was living. He was sentenced to another 15 years. You're all very smart people, and you can count. Yes, that means in August of last year, August 16th to be exact, Gerald was set free again. But remember how I said that Turner was a major pain in the ass during his initial trial? One of those ways was he was able to get the trial transferred to the county over from Fond du Lac to Dane County, I think it's, I'm not good with lawyer speak, and I read the terms of the trial and everything, and I believe it's because the body was found in Dane County, and that was his reasoning, was he wanted to go to Dane. I'm sure his actual reasoning was he didn't want to sit on a jury with people in Lisa Ann's actual community, but he got the trial transferred over to Dane County. Well, thanks to a petition... The state sought and was granted a reversal of that decision. Now he can be tried in a Fond du Lac courtroom. This trial will determine whether or not he is sexually violent and a danger to society. They will decide whether he will be committed under Chapter 980 or his own Turner's Law. Fingers crossed. Thanks for listening. First things first. This person asked to remain anonymous, but one of you beautiful people made me a quilt. An actual beautiful, amazing quilt. My grandma makes quilts, and I know how much love and time goes into them. They even hand-stitched my logo and my send-off. I will definitely be posting pictures of it wherever I can and screaming about it from the rooftops. Thank you so much, my Scottish friend. I love you. Just a heads up, I, pu- I uploaded a new bonus episode on Patreon. It's just me reading some scary true stories to you and interjecting sometimes. But if you want more scary to sleep for as little as a dollar a month, you can join the Patreon page and gain access to all bonus episodes, including all guided nightmares. Speaking of Patreon, let me thank these newcomers. Thank you, Jessica Colton, Lisa Brodeur. <laughs> I don't know how to say your last name. I'm so sorry. And Ellie Wells. Thank you so much, you guys. I am sending you a big hug and big Halloween vibes. Good Halloween vibes. You can follow the show on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. There's not much on YouTube other than these two really weird videos I uploaded, but I'm hoping to actually utilize it in the future. I will be posting also um, all of my resources I used for my true crime portion of the show. I will list in the show notes. Send your stories to scary to sleep at gmail.com or drop me a line on scary to sleep.com. I think that's all for now. Now, go get some sleep. Sweet dreams. <laughs>